if we happen to be live, hello and a happy new year. This is the first uh, stream of the year. Yeah, it's the first one. Yeah. How are um, you feeling? How are you doing? Good, good. Uh, obviously, there was some uh, mischief during the New Year's and Christmas partying, but uh, oh God, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I, I don't think our livers will ever be the same again. No, not really. But so, some fantastic photos. Fantastic experiences yeah. to uh, a New Year's resolution. Oh, uh, be less terrible. <laughs> Lose weight. Mm, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Improve on all guards. I don't have a year. At, like I, I, I read the other day, somebody was talking about um, instead of having a New Year's resolution, they wanted to have like year of a theme. So like year of uh, being of uh, I don't know, being healthier of. Um, uh, being better at work or mindfulness and things like that. Um, I just want to be uh, less uh, terrible. I'm really taking a broad stroke. That, that is indeed a very broad... <laughs> well, it's good. Uh, I hope you're going to achieve your goals there. Uh, same here. What's yours um, before you escape? Um, ability to contain myself from eating cake if I know that there's one in the fridge. Shit, that's a good one. I am struggling with that for the past several years, yeah. but I have high hopes for 2020. That's a really good one. So I actually see that there's quite, uh, well, quite few uh, people already with us. Uh, yeah, we've got. Uh, yeah, we have several already online. I guess yeah. we're gonna start talking about the real deal <laughs> about the former soon. Now, Ryan, I know you have um, an option to give out work files that we're gonna be using now in the chat. So I think you should maybe do that. Yeah, let's do that. Let's. Oh, I actually had the right work file. Uh, Capital letters, work file, and... There we go. So while Ryan is sorting this out, I guess we can officially start. So hello, uh, my name is Armin. I'm a product specialist at Notch. I'm Ryan. I'm also a product specialist at Notch. Uh, <laughs> Notch. And today we're going to talk about uh, deformers. Uh, I'm going to go through the list of deformers. But before I do that, uh, I want to mention that Ryan is here to keep an eye on, uh, on the chat and uh, answer all and any questions either in chat or we're gonna just recreate it on the screen. Yeah, I'm just gonna monitor what all of you crazy people are doing and try and uh, catch some of the questions and bring them up to Armin later on. So uh, there is a work file already given in the um, chat room, so grab that if you want to follow along. Otherwise, this is what we're gonna talk about. So uh, first of all, there's two sets of files here. So there's a start file and a finish file. So I'm gonna quickly go through uh, finish files. So the first stop that we're gonna have is going to be simple deformers. So where you just drag and drop a deformer and it works out of the box. There's quite a few of those. Some of them require extra rigging and we're gonna cover those separately. So in a simple deformer, uh, setup, we're going to check out displacement, smoothing, slice, and chunk effector deformer. Then we're going to move on to specifically chunk effector deformer with shattered mesh that is brought in from another package. Now, in this specific case, it's a Cinema 4D because I use Cinema 4D, but you can do that from any other 3D package that you choose to use. Then it's a uh, altered uh, geometry chapter, and here we're going to see all the options, or quite a few options, on how we can slice and cut and, uh, and cull uh, the geometry. So basically, mirror deformer, slice, extruded faces, generated weight maps, separate faces, cull deformer, you name it. All these fun things. And then the last three things we're going to do is all based on particle and deformer relations. So for instance, here we see particle uh, point deformer, or point deformer that works with particle system. Now from there on, this is a particle bone deformer that treats uh, chunks as particles. And the last one is, um, is particle mesh deformer. So this is fit for uh, cloth and, and liquid simulations based on specific mesh that you have. Right, I, I guess we can start. Yeah, dive right in. Cool, so the first setting is simple deformer. So this is our goal. Uh, and I'm going to quickly recap of what we have in the node graph because we do have a starting point in this case, so we save a little bit of time. So we have a camera that we're looking through now, and I have this render to texture plus two text nodes here, just so we can keep a track of what nodes will we use here. Then we have a two 3D objects here in the bottom, just so we have a little base. So we have a little prop here and there. And we're using Skylight as a lighting system and a path tracer with RT refinements. Now, in this case, there's nothing specifically uh, 
different from default uh, set in uh, Skylight. I think I just reduced the number of uh, sample directions. So if I press Shift R to take uh, to turn off the path tracing, uh, these settings kicks in. So the 50 here. If I press Shift R again, path tracing kicks in, and in the path tracer. Uh, I didn't change anything in the very path tracer. In RT refinement, I set max refine steps to 10, and I turned on the AI denoiser, the NVIDIA one specifically. Now this one works only with NVIDIA cards, so if you see there's a couple of options, I'm going for NVIDIA because, well, I have NVIDIA uh, RTX card inside of this machine. Right, so after this long uh, description, let's actually start. Uh, I'm gonna grab a Shape 3D. I'm gonna connect it to the root. There we go. I think I'm gonna give it a material because by default it's super bright. I think we would make a do with a bit darker so material so we actually see better things. Again, we have path tracer on. Shift R takes it off or on. And let's start uh, with the displacement. There we go. Ryan? Ah, so you're just using a displacement deformer then? Yeah, I just grabbed displacement deformer. As mentioned before, we have a whole list of available deformers. Now, some of them works just out of the box as a displacement deformer does. We already see that it's uh, there, uh, literally displacing or altering the 3D mesh. Uh, some other ones would require extra rigging, and again, we're gonna cover those a little bit later. So, uh, as soon as I add displacement deformer, what it does, it displaces the shape 3D or 3D object that you brought in from your resources to a specific pattern. Yeah, it's just using random noise, so it's just gonna offset things. So, you might notice now that there is this uh, specific cutting in the model as soon as I connect the displacement. And that is all based on the resolution of the model. So if I go to the wireframe view, I see that it actually is following the, uh, the wireframes, basically. Not the wireframes, but the, the points. So we can actually introduce more points so this uh, model becomes a little bit more fluid. Smooth. Smooth, yeah. Smooth. So I can do that by going for subdivision X and Y. So default is 20 by 20. I think I'm gonna bump it up to 90 by 90. And check this out. This became way, way more exciting now. I'm gonna take off the, the path tracing just for now. There we go. So this is a little bit more interesting. So obviously there are settings that we can alter inside of the very node, the displacement uh, effector. Uh, and I would say I leave it up to you to make your choices. I think I want to increase the fractal noise amount in this case. Uh, and add some animation because there's a property for animation rate. So as soon as I do that, I see that it starts to animate. And this is pretty much exciting. I think I don't want this to, to displace too much or I don't want the noise, ah yeah, I want yeah, noise cool. amount quite small. So it's only the fractal noise that I see. Brilliant, uh, so there we go. This is the basis of how majority of uh, deformers works. Big takeaway here is falloffs. Now, there will be times where you might want to affect the 3D model only, only in specific area. So the easiest way to do that is to tick on falloff enabled. Now, what that does that do? It actually gives you a sphere of influence. As you see, the sphere is super huge. So I'm gonna make the range a little bit smaller so we see it better on the screen. So what range does? Range indicates where this falloff should work. I'm gonna increase that falloff inner range so we have a faster step. And just check it out what happens when I start to move it. It is literally affecting the model only where the falloff is hitting the model. There we go. In fact, I'm gonna make it a bit smaller. Bring it down. I think I'm gonna increase the inner falloff. There we go, because I just want this to affect the specific part, maybe I need to tweak the numbers here. Yeah, maybe something like this. Yeah, finding a balance between uh, the noise amount and the displacement amount can be a bit. Yeah, it's, it's never ending story, isn't yeah. it? So I'm gonna spend just a moment more tweaking this up. I think I'm, I'm sort of happy. I think I'm gonna leave the, the, the fall of on, on the whole thing actually. That's all right. So back to the main look, RT on, brilliant. So this is the first uh, step. Um, 
there might be instances where you want to use several of the formers and you are more than welcome to do that. For instance, I can grab something like, uh, what would be obviously different here? Uh, I love the twister format. Twist, I want to fair see the twister enough, format. twist coming up. So I'm adding twist, I'm gonna make some random alterations, maybe this, Let's see if I can offset it in 3D space. No, I guess I should enable the fall of here as well so we see it better. So, a bit more displacement, step, bam. And there it is, it's displacing now in a twist <laughs> shape. Um, uh, stacking order here is very important, so notice what happens if we restack them. All of a sudden, uh, it's either the displacement applied first or the twist, depending on the stacking order. So first, second, third, so on and so forth. So if Notch doesn't recognize the stacking order from top to bottom, it would go for left to right. I think what what uh, the former would illustrate this effect best is smoothing the former. Yeah. So I'm gonna grab smoothing the former. Uh, and it's set by default to one, I'm gonna bump that up quite high to 10. Now notice how all of a sudden this becomes quite smoother. Now would I, if I was to bring it up, all of a sudden is, is not fulfilling its task because now first it's smoothing, then displacing, and then twisting. In this case, we want it to displace, then twist, and then smooth out. Perfect. Um, one uh, other deformer that I personally like very much, I'm gonna give rid of those two, I don't think we really need them, is uh, the slicer. So I'm gonna go for slice deformer. There we go. So this deformer literally slides up, slices up the geometry. We're gonna cover quite a few of those in a separate chapter, but I think it well fits here. Now there's one thing. <coughs> We're sli slicing the geometry, uh, but we don't really see the inner uh, part of this slice. So we can make sure about that. We can make sure that this material is double-sided. So I'm gonna go for materials. And I'm gonna scroll down to the option that allows me to make sure that uh, backface cull mode is double-sided. Bam, there we go, much better. So now in the slice deformer, we can make some alterations. Maybe the slices could be smaller, it could be more of them, and it could be perhaps twisted. Yeah, this is a little bit more exciting. Cool, so there's a good reason why I added this slice deformer. I think it will help me to uh, illustrate another uh, effector. Uh, sorry, the former, that requires a little bit more rigging, but it's very exciting and very useful. I think I'm gonna make sure that this animates a little bit slower so it's not that intrusive. So, next one I'm adding is a chunk effector deformer. Now, as mentioned, several of... Uh, uh, you might wanna just quickly go back to the slice deformer. I mean, there isn't that much to mention here. You just play around with the values and you'll get pretty much <coughs> the same thing. Um, the only thing that's key with the slice deformer is that it's actually cutting into the mesh, so you're actually changing the topology of a mesh. So while, while the uh, displacement deformer is just moving around vertices that are already there, the slice deformer is actually cutting into the mesh uh, and creating new uh, geometry. Funny you should mention that, because I'm about to uh, literally illustrate that with the chunk effector deformer. So with the chunk effector deformer, we can uh, move all those slices that we have now separately, we can offset them. So the way that chunk effector deformer works, it takes advantage of all the effectors available in a cloner system. So if we hover over the inputs here, I can see that the first one is called effectors. So I think I'm gonna grab just, a, let's say, randomized effector. I'm gonna pipe it into that appropriate input, the first one here. And now if I go to the second part of transform uh, settings, so the first one is just transform, and that corresponds with 3D positional values of a vector. And the second one is literally what does that effector do? So in this case, I want this to go for a uniform scale, be smaller, and perhaps offset in some directions. And you see all of a sudden, all these little bits are offsetting separately. So, in many respects, not only we chunked it up. No sound? We don't have sound, what's going on? Do we not have sound? Hmm. You can, Cat, it's okay if you speak, it's fine. Yeah. Did we lose the connection then? We have sound, okay. We're getting uh, conflicting information. It looks like everything is fine, so we're gonna keep going. 
Yeah, um, it's, it seems that 2020 has some surprises uh, ready it for does. us. Whoever said that 2020 would make things easier? We'll make it easier. Well, well I, I will manage not to eat cake and you <laughs> will manage to, to work out more and we're gonna reach our goals. <laughs> be a better person. Yes, I indeed, indeed. So, uh, randomized effector. I basically just offset uh, different uh, transforms and now you see that we are controlling all of these uh, slices separately. So now we're doing this with the, with the primitive 3D object that we have here, uh, a shape 3D. We can actually control in the very same way import the 3D mesh if it's pre-sliced. Uh, cool. I think we can check that out. Yeah, go for it. So in the timeline, I'm going to switch through to the second sample, Chenka Factor um, Deformer with a shattered mesh. So in this case, this mesh is actually brought in from Cinema 4D. That's exactly where it shattered this one uh, and first I'm going to show you how to rig it in notch and then I'm going to show you how to prepare it for instance in Cinema 4D because I'm Cinema 4D user. Again any other 3D software 3D package will allow you to do that. Now as mentioned since uh, I already did it so we have it here available for us uh, in the in the node graph it came in as a 3D object. There is a little problem with it. Uh, this model seems to be very oddly smoothed out. You see there's these cuts and it looks a little bit horrible. Uh, this happens because we have some uh, normal smoothing. So as soon as we add a material node, for instance, and in a material node, we go to uh, normal settings. Let's see, normal smoothness. If we take out that smoothness, all these cuts disappear. So we basically don't want these normals here to smooth. They are making it look a bit odd. They are incorrect. So I'm setting it to zero. Uh, I left lines visible on this model so we actually see where the cuts are happening. Now I did that by just going to the property called lines. And you can turn it on and off. In, in this case, I think it's handy for us to have it there to see it. Now, the way the chunk effector deformer would work, I I'll just grab this. Uh, chunk effector deformer. I'm going to connect it to the 3D mesh that I have here. There is one specific settings that we, setting that we need to change for this to work with imported 3D model. So instead of vertex source mode vertex, we're going to go for chunks because this is literally chunked up. So I'm going to grab a, a random, random effector or randomized effector. I'm going to feed it into the first input effectors. Stick on the uniform scale and I'm going to make things a little bit smaller. There we go. I already see that it's working. In, in fact, I can add more effectors here. Uh, in this case, I'm going to go for plane effector. Cool. Let's connect that to the same input. Any and all effectors will connect to the first input. The very same one, effectors. So plane effector, uh, just like any deformer, has its fall off. Now, if I zoom out, I will see that there's this huge, huge sphere of influence, but it's super big. I think it's rather too big for us to take advantage of, so I'm going to make the fall of smaller. There we go. My model is a little bit higher, 0.2. I think I'm going to make sure that this effector is in the same position on the y-axis. There we go. You could so also, uh, rather than move the effector, just parent the... Um we'll get to that. Uh, if you want to do it that way. <laughs> so in the plane effector, uh, I think I want this to perhaps as well become smaller or bigger, depending on where it is in the 3D space. And instead of the uh, add, add mode in a position, I'm going to go for multiply. So let's see what happens if I'm scrolling through the model now. Oh, that's pretty neat. All right, uh, cool. Uh, I think this is actually getting somewhere. So. Uh, I could animate the plane effectors property on a position X, or, or I can actually add a couple more uh, effectors, for instance, and for instance, and animate them at the same time. Uh, there's a good reason why there's parenting option in every single effector here. Now we're not using it; we're not parenting this node to anything, but it's still running. The reason why it has parenting is because we can grab, for instance, a null. I'm going to connect it to the root. And we can connect the null with the plane effector, for instance. So now, if I'm moving the null, it's moving the plane effector. So with this logic, I can add even more effectors. Uh, let's say turbulence. Let's grab the turbulence. I'm going to pipe it into the first input here, yet again. 
And I don't want this to do anything super exciting. I just want this to change the heading pitch and bank. So I'm going to make sure that the follow here is small as well. Cool. Ah, I did put the plane effector a little bit up. I think I'm going to do the same one with the turbulence. Uh, I'm going to just take this moment just to remind everyone that if you're commenting on something other than uh, Twitch, we're not going to be seeing the feed. We're currently only monitoring the, um, the Twitch feed. Yes. So, Come uh, join us on Twitch. Yeah. If, and if, you want to say, if you don't want to say anything, that's fine. That's fine as well, yeah. Enjoy, enjoy Armin's uh, beautiful, beautiful English voice. I do have an accent, which probably makes it a bit more <laughs> charming, I guess. I would like to believe such. Anyways, now we have uh, two effectors, and we are controlling both of them with this null. Uh, instead of us uh, going back and forward with this uh, handle, I think we might as well just add a modifier. Uh, I'm going to grab math modifier, because math modifier literally oscillates between two values. So as you see here in the graph, it's going to go up and down, up and down from uh, minus 1 to 1, for instance. So I'm going to apply this on a position x value. There we go. It's a little bit spastic, I'd say. Let's decrease the speed. All right, that's better. In fact, since now we have a null and we are affecting the positional values, we can make this a little bit easier for us to read if we add some kind of a visual indication of where that fall off lives. So I just want to mark up this sphere. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to grab a shape 3D. And I'm going to connect it to the very same null. So now the shape 3D is actually moving together with a null. Uh, I'm going to bring it a little bit up as well, so 0 0.2 here. Now, it is sort of fulfilling the purpose that I wanted to fulfill, but it's actually intruding. So instead of sphere, I think I'm going to set it to a ring. Now I see my ring is uh, on the wrong axis, so I can change that. Let's see, Z. I think it's flipped uh, from the other way, so we can just turn it around. There we go, that's our ring. I think I'm going to make the inner radius bigger, and I'm going to add more subdivisions so it's smoother. And there we go. Is it the same size? Could actually be bigger. So now we literally see how this uh, mesh is being cut with the falloffs. It's like a little indication. So obviously, with this sort of a rigging, we can set up some interactive points. Now, we should use something like uh, mouse picker or any other tool like OSC or MIDI. That's all available. That's literally how you would do that. I see this workflow very useful if you need to pick a model apart, if you have a nice 3D model of a car with a lot of intricate details and you want to show what's under the hood. So you could actually make a very cool interactive setting using this. Uh, Armin, a question from Ted. Uh, do you know of any way to affect chunks on an, on an Alimbic mesh? Um, I'd assume it's basically the same thing. If it comes through. Yeah, I, I would, I would though, suggest to convert it to the OBJ. It's the simplest one. I, yeah. I just would go for that. The reason why I'm using Cinema 4D file because not natively supports .c4d files. Otherwise, I'd say the best practice is just to export it as OBJ and you're fine. Yeah, now, the, uh, the key thing to note is this only works, um, the chunk effector specifically only works when it's a single mesh that's all combined together. So even though different chunks of it will be different closed meshes, um, it will be part of one larger mesh. So if, you, if your Olympic scene is set up like that, then I can't see any reason it wouldn't work. Uh, again, I'm going to show you guys how to do that in Cinema 4D, and I am super sure that every single 3D uh, software actually allows you to do that, or well, at least the major ones. Yeah. I, I can vouch for that. But before we do that, I want to add one more deformer uh, and address uh, the way you would make sure that it actually moves with its falloff together with the null. Now, uh, let's first of all uh, connect it to the 3D object that we have. So I chose turbulence. I think I'm going to make it quite, quite reasonably visible. So you see it's turbulating. Uh, the goal now is to make sure that the fall of here is way smaller. So first of all, I'm going to enable it, make it smaller. There's our sphere. There's that ring of influence. I'm going to increase the inner fall of so the step would be smaller. It would take effect much faster and cruder. So. Natural progression here, or our thinking would be to attach it to position X, Y, and Z, which is great. You can do that. But if you hover over the inputs, you will see that there is an input called fall of node. Now, what that means is that if I grab a specific uh, point, it could be a null, it could be a 3D object, I can pipe that in, and then all of a sudden, 
this turbulence is actually following through and moving together or moving the fall off. So instead of making three connections, X, Y, Z, just connect that one and you're good to go. In fact, I think I should flesh this out to 0 0.2 as well, so it's actually staying in the right position. It there we go. It would make more sense in hindsight to have all of these on zero and then move the null up. Or, in fact it would, wouldn't it? Or, you connect, uh, have all of them on zero, and from the null, connect that to the shape 3D. Wait, first oh, I'm gonna zero okay. everything out. <laughs> and now we can actually just lift this up. Now I think our shape 3D was offset as well. Yeah, there we go. So that's just smarter way of, of doing things, and that's why we are a team. That's <laughs> we are. That's why we are doing this stream together. I take I take all of your extravagance and I shorten it. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. Um, right. So let's try to make it in Cinema 4D, for instance. I'm gonna open that up. I'll give it a moment to load up. Yeah, best part about Cinema 4D, it has to load, and it will load. It's, I mean, it loads it's quicker than fast. Mine, so I'll give it that. Uh, okay, I'm going to choose something a little bit more interesting, maybe the platonic, for instance. Uh, again, every single 3D uh, package has its own, um, has its own different uh, tools for that. But here, in this case, maybe we should make sure that we see the, the chat as we are speaking, uh, we can use something called the uh, Voronoi fracture. So anything put under the Voronoi fracture gets these cuts. And that's pretty much it. Obviously, we could go and make more cuts or change the position, offset the seed. I think we're fine with the default. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to press C. I'm going to make all these little bits to a, a 3D object. Yeah, this is a really important step. If you don't do this and you just try and bring in a mesh, uh, at least <coughs> from uh, cinema, it's not going to work because you haven't actually told uh, cinema to um, make it into models, it? Like, yeah, because yeah, rasterize it, sort of thing. Just like compress it down into a a more generic. Uh, yeah, because if if you bring in any model uh, from the list here, uh, this is a proprietary tool from uh, cinema. We we don't necessarily read uh, these type of models. It's just like our shape three D. They have their own thing. If you want to take advantage of that notch, make sure to make it into a three uh, D model. So for instance, if, it's a, if it's a cube, just press C and make sure that it's a model. All of a sudden, there's a UV tag and it shows up as a 3D model. Now, there's one more step here. Uh, we have a lot of bits and pieces. We don't actually have to have it in bits and pieces. What we want is that everything is connected and uh, welded together. So that's what we did. We just went for connect object and delete. So even though it comes up as one object, in Notch, this will be recognized as a 3D object that has uh, chunks and cuts. Yeah, each and uh, it's important to make sure that um, all the vertices are still kept separate. I think, what was the thing you noticed the other day? Um, yeah, I think when you're exporting uh, an OBG file, you have to make sure to tick on a specific property. Uh, it's ma you make sure that it doesn't export, that it does, yeah, you're right. Duplicate vertices, yeah? Yeah, make sure it does, otherwise it will automatically weld all the um, vertices together that it finds are in common. And that's exactly what you don't want to yeah. happen. So <laughs> be sure to take this on. Again, uh, all the other 3D packages has uh, tools alike to solve this. Now I'm, gonna, now I'm gonna go no, not going to follow through. I'm not going to save this. Uh, you have this asset already available for you. If you're a Cinema user, go ahead, grab it, check it out. Uh, otherwise, it's available here in resources for you. So this is chunk effector deformer. So big takeaways so far is the, the fact that majority of deformers works on their own. They have various parameters how to shape them uh, and they have fall-offs. Fall-offs are the areas of influence. Now they could be triggered in the actual node or some of them actually would require an extra node to enable all the deformations, all the different parameters that can be altered. Are we good to go for the next sample? Yeah, go for it. Fair enough. The next one on the list is altered geometry. Now, this one has quite uh, a few uh, nodes used. Uh, as you see, there's a whole stack of them, and there's actually several 3D objects. I think we're going to just open the, the clean start point, and we're just going to start adding one by one by one. Um, I think. A good place would be a shape 3D and a slice deformer. I think I'm going to go on and, and do that. 
So here we have a shape 3D. Let's add, add slice deformer. Ryan, I feel that you want to say something. I mean, we've seen you, you're always using a sphere. How? Should we use a rounded box instead? Is a rounded box for this one? But sphere looks so much nicer. So, oh, so nice. Well, I tell you what, I'll rig in a couple of deformers and then we're going to switch it to a box. Okay. If you feel that the box looks better, we're going to stick with the box. But give a sphere a chance. I'm just, I'm throwing a spanner in your works. I want to see Fair what enough. else we can do. Uh, we, we will definitely do that. I'm reducing the slice thickness and I think I want several more slices. Yeah, that's good. So, uh, how do we make this a little bit more interesting? Well, let's add extruded faces, uh, the former. Bam. I'm connecting it beneath the slice deformer and all of a sudden we're actually extruding a 3D geometry in accordance to those slices. So these yeah, and this is where you can really tell that uh, it is actually creating new geometry, like I mentioned earlier. It's not just, um, these things aren't just uh, like offsetting a shader or something. It is uh, cutting into a mesh and uh, removing around the... Uh, and creating new geometry. In fact, I think we're going to make sure that it's double-sided material too. So I'm adding a material node. I'm going to set the call mode to double-sided so we see the inner part a bit nicer. So let's go and find that setting, which is... You could search for it. Right, very good point. So if I know the name, which is backface call, I can actually type it in. I just have to know how to spell. Yeah, that's, that <laughs> tends to be the first step. <laughs> okay, so there we go. Uh, I actually can find it via this search tab. So I'm going to choose double-sided. It looks a little bit better. Now, mind you, again, we have uh, path tracing with AI denoisement going on. So that's why there's this shimmer. If we just turn it off and we go for the regular, regular skylight rendering, you see that it's quite static. But that's fine. I'm willing to forgive the shimmer because literally it makes things nicer. I'm, I'm okay with AI making its thing. Cool. Uh, so we have those two now. Yeah, uh, the other thing is we're just previewing it in ray tracing at the moment. If yeah, yeah, pretty if much. If you want to render it properly, then you render it properly. Good point, good point. So I think I'm going to add one more shape 3D. Uh, and on that shape 3D, I'm going to I'm gonna do a separate faces deformer. I'm going to add separate face deformer. So I want something as an outer shell. So shape 3D. Let's connect it to the root. In fact, this could stay in the center, so we don't have to offset things. Let's make it a bit bigger. And let's uh, find a separate face deformer. There we are. Let's connect it to the shape 3D. And I already see that it's separating. So there are several ways uh, it does that. It could do that by vertex or chunks. I think we're going to stick around with the vertex. Uh, I think we can uh, apply a weight map here so it doesn't literally reveal, uh, so it reveals only specific spots of, uh, of this uh, object in accordance to an image fed into the weight map deformer. So I'm just going to tweak the separate face deformer a little bit. Let's make it bigger. These chunks maybe something like this. Yeah, I think it's fine for now. I'm going to leave it at that. So. Weight map deformer or generate weight map deformer. That's probably one of the handier uh, deformers in the list. So what it does, it allows you to set specific areas of influence. Now, if we can do that with falloffs, in this case, we can do that with the image, for instance. Yeah, so um, weight maps are a pretty common uh, 3D graphics, um, uh, well, what's the word? Like tools, tools I guess. Yeah. Tools. <laughs> tools? So, uh, and uh, it, this just allows you to add a weight map to anything and generate it within Notch. So you don't need to go back into your modeling package to generate a weight map. Yeah, because then basically maybe you want the deformation specifically in that little triangle there. So you just make a triangle and place it specifically in that spot that you designated in the 3D model. Let's talk less and let's show more. I think it's going to make more <laughs> sense when we actually rig it up. So uh, I grabbed fractal noise from the generators. I'm uh, holding shift and double clicking on the node. Here we can see uh, exactly how this fractal noise looks. In fact, I'm going to press on the preview in the viewport. And I think I'm going to shape it up a little bit. Let's make it bigger. So I'm going for 2,000 by 2,000. Uh, and I think I want a bit more gain here. There we go. 
So this is very, very obvious. This is very crude, like it's easy to read and see. So uh, this noise, uh, this fractal noise, we can feed into the image input here. So that's the very first one in the generate weight map node. Now we can choose how do we apply it. So first of all, we're gonna choose a mode texture and we can actually preview that. So we can click on show weight map. So this is exactly where this texture is applied. So this very same texture now is being wrapped on the 3D model. Great, so it does wrap, but it doesn't really uh, do anything or it doesn't really uh, affect it in any way. And that is because uh, we need to tell uh, this separate phase deformer separate faces deformer to use generated weight maps as a deformation. So if we hover over the inputs, we will see that majority of, uh, of the factors uh, of, the, uh, of the formers actually has an input for that. So let's pipe in the generated weight map deformer to the second input weight map. And uh, there we go. So now we're literally making all these alterations in accordance to the picture given here, the fractal noise. I can tick off the show weight map property. So that's a good way to alter your geometry as well. I think we're gonna apply this, uh, this deformer later on as well in some other settings. Um, okay, so uh, there is another one that is quite fun. Uh, cull deformer. So imagine you have a situation where you have an object that you brought in and let's say it's a model of two shoes and these two shoes are sort of standing like this and you're super happy with it but your art director comes and says brilliant uh, but we only need one shoe. So do you actually go back to your modeling uh, software and you just delete one or remodel things? You could or you could grab a cull deformer. So what Cal Deformer does, now mind you, I'm gonna connect Cal Deformer to both shape 3Ds. So what Cal Deformer does, it just cuts off the 3D object. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, so sometimes it might be a, a life savior thing. So basically you, you could easily even animate in and out the 3D object in this manner if you, if you choose so. I think I'm gonna make sure to cut it in some fashionable way. For instance, like this. I know it doesn't make sense, or it doesn't even look pretty, but I think you get the gist on what the cull deformer is. Now, I am going to add one more shape 3D, because in my little list here, I see that I have mirror deformer listed as the first thing. Uh, to be honest, this is a good time to address it. So I'm gonna make this smaller. I could even bring it a little bit higher here. And I can apply the mirror deformer here. So mirror deformer does exactly what the name stands for. You know what? It just mirrors things. That, that might be very handy at some point as well. Uh, to change the shape to a torus. I always think that's a really good way to... I'll grant you a torus. There we go. So now you can, if you just pan around a bit, you can see how it is mirroring it. It's not just copy and pasting it between the middle. It is changing the topology. <clears throat> changing the topology again. So there is no uh, rules about how many deformers you can apply on one 3D object uh, or how many 3D objects you can use with one deformer. You, you can stack them and rig them any sort of way you like. And as you see, some of them actually work hand in hand. So for instance, generate weight map deformer. It's, it's a great tool to, to enable your other deformers to do more or more specific things. I hope that makes sense. Um, cool, if there is no specific settings, uh, if there is no specific questions about the setting, uh, we might as well go on to the particle stuff. Yeah, go for it, we're speed round now. Uh, are we, are we going too fast? Uh, I'm not seeing anything. Fair enough. So the first one is a point deformer. Now, the way point deformer works, it takes a particle system uh, and it displaces a 3D model uh, in accordance to those points moving around via particle behavior. So let's rig that in. Let's set that up. I'm gonna grab a shape 3D. I'm gonna connect it to the root. I think now I can afford to bring it a little bit higher, make it smaller. Cool. Let's add point deformer. You see the first input here in point deformer states point source. Now I know for a fact that the best way to 
generate points is literally to make a small particle system. So yeah, it's worth noting that this isn't just something you can use with particles. You can also use um, like I think you might be able to connect nulls directly into it, or at least a transform array. You can just anything that gives you an array of points is something that you can uh, use here. I tell you what, we try it with particles, and then we try it with nulls. Oh, we'll have fun. <laughs> okay, let's start with the little particle system. Uh, to build a little particle system in Notch, it, uh, you just need several nodes. To be honest, I think four is more than enough. So we obviously need particle root. Particle root is a mandatory node. Everything concerning particles will spawn from particle root because it's a vast subject and it requires its own hub. Everything will be color coded orange too for the convenience. Uh, we're gonna grab a primitive emitter. I think by default it's rather big. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make it smaller and I'm going to lift it to the position of the actual 3D model that we have here. Um, we need, let's make sure that we see it. So I'm going to grab point renderer. So we actually see the points. Uh, and we need some kind of a behavior. So I'd say maybe curl noise fluid effector. It's a long name for a super powerful, very neat little node. And if I start simulation, I already see that these particles are spawning. Now it's vastly too many, like it's, it's just greatly too much of them. Uh, I think I'm gonna reduce the numbers. I'm going to the primitive emitter. I'm gonna drop the numbers here to like 20 particles. Let's restart the playhead. Yeah, that's more than plenty for the sample that we are going after. As a good housekeeping measure in the particle root, I will drop the numbers as well to the closest available number. So if it's 20 that I'm using, I'm gonna set the allowance to 64. That's just better for, for, for performance. Cool, uh, I see that the curl noise deformer has a fall off as well and it's vast, it's super huge. I think I'm just gonna make it smaller so the radius is more or less closer to the actual 3D object. So, uh, nice, maybe we can make a little bit different animation here because it looks like it's jittering so I'm just gonna Reduce the fluid simulation speed, reduce the noise size, and I'm gonna increase the curl noise amount. I think this looks a little bit better, like they move a little bit slicker. Brilliant, so how do we make those two uh, node sets work together? Well, we, all we have to do is grab the particle root output, and as we click on it, we see that there's two inputs that lits, uh, lights up, so that indicates that that's plausible hookups. Point source, let's go for that. And as we do, there we go. We are deforming this 3D model in accordance to the points given by this particle system. Let's make it a bit heavier. In fact, this could be smoother, just like in the first sample, let's just add more geometry to go about like 90 by 90, for instance. And in fact, we do have a smoothing deformer. I think this will help out a lot to make this more flesh. Let's be generous, maybe 10. There we go. Um, it's a little bit fast, let's slow it down. All right, so this is the point deformer. Uh, we promised that we're gonna try it out with nulls, didn't we? Yeah, let's give it a go. I'm gonna move this a little bit aside. I'm pressing control one to disable those nodes. Let's add some geometry nulls. I'm gonna hook this off. Uh, it's not a null, then it must be just transform arrays then. Uh, but you can pipe them through. Yeah, fair enough. But I think you can achieve quite a bit and, and quite interesting things with particles should you use that. So let's just hook it back in. There we go. Uh, again, this 3D model is a little bit too bright. So let's just make it a little bit more shaded. Cool. So this is point. Uh, what is uh, next in our list? And next in our list is a particle based deformers bone uh, <laughs> bone deformer, particle bone deformer. So if we manage to play around with this imported 3D object uh, and, and use chunk effector to alter its positions and looks, we can actually make sure that these chunks become particles. So we can take advantage of all the things that particle system offers. Uh, and add some uh, some physics to it. It's not perfect physics. For perfect physics, you would likely go for something like rigid body system. But for simple stuff like uh, this fall and, and uh, collision, we can definitely use the particle bone deformer. So I already have the starting point here. So there's two collision uh, objects or two objects that we're gonna use as collision. 
That very same 3D imported model, I think I'm gonna enable lines so we see the, the chunks better. So there's the lines, let's make it a little bit more dim. We have these smoothings on normals, we don't want that. So let's grab material. I'm gonna add material and as Ryan suggested for lazy people such as I am, I'm not gonna scroll and look for the setting, I'm just gonna type it in. So I need cull, oh no, sorry, I need normals. I need normal smoothing. Normal smoothness, zero please. There we go. Perfect, I think we're ready. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna grab a particle bone deformer. As I'm typing in particle, I see that's one of the first options. There is one specific setting we have to change a year instead of source mode mesh bones we're going to choose mesh chunks because we want to affect the bits of it not necessarily the overall model as one but it's bits it's chunks so with this node attached now we can add any and all particle effectors and they're just going to work for instance i can grab a turbulence effector and i'm going to set something ridiculous like really fast velocity there we go so all of a sudden, these, these bits of, uh, of uh, geometry, these chunks, are treated as a particle, and all the effectors are animating in accordance. Let's read something more interesting. Let's grab uh, SPH. Ryan, what does SPH stand for? Smooth Particle Hydrogen Dynamics. <laughs> that, is, that is one of the three acronyms that I probably know uh, in general, and I'm super proud that I actually know this one. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, well done, oh, well God. done. You stented it. You caught me, it caught me off guard there. So uh, I, I guess smooth particle hydrodynamics doesn't say much for some. Uh, so what this node does, uh, it actually enables uh, a system to have some physical properties. So for, for instance, uh, something like gravity, something like rigidness of, of the particle, that's all there. And as you see now, as soon as we connected the SPH, the, the sphere has gravity. The sphere starts to fall. It's not really colliding with anything just yet. Well, because we need a, a collision effector to define and tell Notch that these two 3D objects are the collision objects. So collision effector. I'm gonna connect it to the particle bone deformer. And I'm gonna connect those two 3D objects to its first input collision uh, object node. Bam, let's try this now. Bam, it did, it works, great. Uh, I think I'm gonna restart the playhead. I'm gonna make this material a little bit darker so we see it nicer. And I'm gonna add one more shape 3D as a collision body so it collides with the sphere and then collides with these two uh, little 3D objects in the bottom. Let's make it smaller. I think I want this a little bit forward. It shouldn't collide from the get-go, it should just get there. Maybe smaller still. Okay, now we need to connect it to the collision effector as well. Let's do that. Bam, there we go, it's working. Now notice what happens with the pieces. Uh, Notch still thinks of all these pieces as, as little point. So if I would zoom in, I would probably see that some of the 3D objects actually collides and intersects the newly made shape 3D or the sphere, uh, we can alter that by adding more point collision radius. So what point collision radius does, it literally introduces a bit of distance. Now I really overdid it this time, you see that. So this little setting right here comes very handy when you have to define what distance does this particle should be counted off to compensate for the actual 3D geometry so that it wouldn't literally hit the, the 3D surface and melt into it. Obviously we could tweak and tweak and tweak this further and further. I guess we could set the collision effector instead of thin mesh to extruded mesh. I think that will solve, uh, that will just make the parts slide nicer. Now notice what happens if we leave it on a default setting thin mesh. It collides and it slides, but then it starts to jitter here and there. Uh, best way to solve it, extruded mesh, it's more accurate, then it slides off way slicker. There we go, so uh, in fact, we can uh, push this a notch further. Are you gonna trademark that? 
Uh, I, I think it's already abused. I'm just using this. So what I'm doing now, I'm going to build a small particle system. Uh, I'm going to add a mesh emitter. So I'm going to use the very same mesh as emitter. I'm going to add point render to, to actually see the particles. And I'm going to reuse the same effectors as I have here connected to the particle bone deformer. So mesh emitter. Yes, as you see, it came in hashed out red. That indicates that this node requires extra information. In this case, what mesh should it use? Great. Let's add a point effector or point renderer. And this is all set up. It's all set up, but it doesn't uh, connect or talk to the SPH or collision just yet. So before I do that, I think I'm going to just drop the particle numbers. It's just greatly too many there. Uh, let's yeah, I see. just lower the emission rate here. Just set it to like 0 0.1. Emission rate. Yeah. 0 0.1 you said, yeah? Yeah. Okay. That might not be low enough, but we'll see. Fair enough. Okay. Well, now let's connect the very same SPH and the very same collision effector. And there we go. So the particles are actually working together with the uh, chunks. So I'm not saying that this is pretty or useful, but this is one of the ways you could, uh, you could actually bring it a little bit further. You could add, let's say, trail render, and not only the chunks then falling, but the chunks has actually trails in it, and you can make some really weird and really abstract fun things with it. Cool. Questions? Ryan. Uh, somebody wants us to debate lighting setups. <laughs> Lighting setups. Well, I can, I can actually explain the lighting setup that we have here if that's of interest. I, I think you should change it entirely. Uh, okay, what let's, lighting setup would add, you prefer? Let's add uh, two directional lights. Directional lights. If you wish to be boring, this I can is, entertain this you. This is exactly what someone wanted. It was just to, to argue, and so I have. So just regular lights, yeah. Argument. Okay, regular <laughs> lights, correct? Uh, one one re regular light and one directional light. So, okay. And make sure they're colored nicely. It's all white at the moment. I feel pressure now, Ryan, please. <laughs> is, this is live. Do not do this to me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now nobody can argue that it's not live. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, good that. point. Uh, in fact, I could uh, turn on shadow casting or I can just turn on path tracing. I oh, know, I still need to do that. There we go. So, uh, we can actually treat this as a path traced light as well. So if you see in the light, there's a shadow map uh, type. So let's just go for ray traced. It's just going to be nicer. Yeah, it's really sharp shadows now. Yeah, I kind of like it actually. Well, you ask for colors. There's two colors in event industry specifically that makes uh, magic. Cyan, magenta. So let's start with this one. And you said you want directional light. Let's add directional light. Directional light in this case will be magenta and let's ray trace that one as well i don't think it really works well when there's two of those it's either uh, one or the other to, you'd need to like uh, soften the shadows a lot i think yeah like directional light is great if you soften the shadows a lot and you add two or three and you can get some really nice uh, soft shadows from different angles oh well, fine so soft shadows and then the regular light uh, yeah, soft shadows on that one as well. Do you feel entertained now? I am quite entertained. Very good. I'm glad that you joined me on this journey of pointless. <laughs> no, it's not pointless. Uh, well, we, we just tried out different lighting setup. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. Why not? The reason why I usually go for, let's say, something like Skylight, because uh, with a uh, setup of, as you see here, uh, three nodes, you can achieve really, really nice light. And I don't think there's a nicer lighting system that something that is a dome lighting or skylight in, in our software. So I would encourage you guys to check it out. If, in fact, if you're interested, uh, I can just uh, rig the start point, the light system that we had here in the end of the stream, saying, okay, we added this node, this node, and we set this and that. Again, there's like three settings. That's it. It's super simple. Yeah, comment what you want to see, and uh, I'll make Armin do it, clearly. Are you going to enjoy and abuse this, it seems? But before <laughs> you do that, there's one more setting that we set out to uh, build, which is a uh, mesh deformer, so particle-based uh, mesh deformer. So this uh, set of nodes or this tool is perfect for something like clot simulation or, I don't know, I, I would even say something of a liquid simulation, but I would 
definitely choose. Like uh, you could maybe do the surface of a liquid, maybe, but more like yeah. Because um, if you want normal liquid sort of, yeah, if you want liquids, it's, it's procedurals. Yeah, yeah, procedurals. Uh, maybe fields. It's yeah. Do, both, it depends on the kind of liquid you're looking for. Both both of these things are like separate topics that could be. Yeah. Uh, well, one of them is already a stream, so I encourage you guys to check out. There's one about fields, and hopefully we will make one about procedurals uh, quite uh, soon after this one. Cool, so uh, how do we move this uh, little quad? How do we make it into a cloth? Well, obviously first we need a uh, particle mesh deformer. So I'm gonna connect that. And as you see, all of a sudden screen went black. That is because it kicked in. So if I restart the playhead, ah, oh, there it's back. Brilliant. So just like with the uh, bone deformer, we can actually use any and all a particle effector. So I think I'm gonna start with the cloth effector because, well, that's literally where we are going. So we want to build a cloth, don't we? So cloth, um, turbulence, I presume. I'm not changing any settings now, I'm just adding nodes, then I'm gonna start tweaking them. Uh, perhaps spring, so it just sort of goes back and forward a little bit. Okay, let's see how that looks. Horrible. But it does, it, does, it does work, this is a good starting point. So I think a smart thing to do now would be to lock the FPS count. So indeed I actually locked it off already, so by default it's set to zero to 9999. Uh, the reason why you would lock the, the FPS count of the whole scene is because then you have a chance to make a more accurate calculation. Uh, the particles are calculating directly for that FPS count. Ryan can elaborate yeah, more on that. When particles uh, calculate uh, at varying uh, FPSs, it just means that when you render to video, it's gonna look different. Because uh, if you imagine a trail, for example, it's gonna render a new point for the trail every frame, and that's gonna look different if it's at 120 frames per second versus 60 or 30, just because um, if, you are, if you want it to render 32 trails, they're gonna be way closer together at 120 frames a second than at 30. Gloom is pointing out very nicely that uh, Skylight is, uh, is, is expensive computationally. Uh, I'm just coming back to that thing. Y yes, indeed, it's expensive, but it's well worth the price if your GPU can handle it. Uh, but be aware, the numbers definitely increase and the room becomes hotter as you add Skylight. Um, okay, let's tweak these uh, nodes right here. I think I'm gonna leave the cloth as is for now, turbulence. Um, maybe a little bit more velocity. Uh, spring, let's dampen it and let's make it a little bit less strong. Let's just go for more accurate numbers like 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Let's see how that looks. This, this sort of starts to look a little bit more interesting. Obviously we could push and push the numbers, but I think it's the normal smoothing that seems to be. Yeah, 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 that's true. So there's a material and the normals there are actually set to zero in smoothing, let's see. So that's the same procedure we did before. Oh no, it's, it's actually set to correct setting. You know what would fix this? Is uh, smoothing the former. Uh, it was, um, yeah, 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 that'll definitely do it as well. But uh, I think specifically what I was referring to was um, the normal smoothing angle. Because the normal smoothing angle uh, changes where it will start smoothing. Smoothing angle. Yeah, good point. Yeah, that... So if you raise that to quite hmm. high, then it will start smoothing at harsher angles. Fair enough. Well, so now, I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm gonna bring it back to the default. By the way, you can do that by pressing this reset property to default. Uh, uh, button, uh, because I, I literally added a smoothing uh, deformer, and I think it makes justice for us. Now, again, stacking order is important. If you apply it before particle mesh deformer, it looks like it does nothing. It actually does its task, but uh, it smooths it, and then it goes for the mesh deformer. So it doesn't make sense. It has to first be uh, altered with particle mesh deformer, and then smooth it out. One more thing that would make sense here is uh, to make sure that uh, this cloth doesn't go berserk and crazy so we can actually lock it up to a specific shape. This is again where the weight map deformer comes so, so handy. So I'm gonna add weight, generate weight map deformer. I'm gonna connect it to the shape 3D. And uh, in this case, it's not fractal noise that I'm after, but I'm gonna go for gradient. So I'm gonna grab gradient. I'm gonna pipe it to the first input image 
and if we preview the gradient now, I see that it's actually linear. Now, I don't like that. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna make it big, huge, 2,000 by 2,000, and I'm gonna make it radial, and I'm gonna make sure that it's put a bit, there, bit bigger inner range. Cool, so now I want this generate weight map node to actually refer to this texture. So in the mode, I'm gonna choose texture, and I want to see this texture, so show weight map. Cool, so this is all done. Now all I have to do is make sure that the generated weight map actually talks to the particle mesh deformer. And I see that the thir third input there is weight image. Or actually, sorry, uh, <laughs> the first one is generated weight map. That's, that's exactly where we want to connect. And as I do, and if I restart the playhead, there we go. It is displacing in the shape of the circle. Uh, we could obviously invert this circle, and then it's doing the opposite. Then it's affecting things around it. Again, no limit on which or how many uh, effectors you want to use here. Feel free to try them all out. Now, uh, the, the exciting part, questions. So we got a question, uh, I just quickly responded to it, but maybe we could go into more detail, is um, when you add a uh, piece, of, when you import a piece of geometry, should you subdivide it in, in that tool before it comes in, or should you use the subdivisions within Notch? Uh, I usually use subdivisions for proprietary, like the shape 3D that we have. Um, I don't know, maybe you can wait like, uh, more if you're that. importing a mesh. So in, in my opinion, I don't know how uh, uh, verified this is, maybe uh, uh, Gloom will uh, uh, differ with me on this, but uh, I think that it's gonna be very case by case, and that if you can do it in Notch, like if you're just importing like a very basic shape, then yeah, you can probably get away with subdividing. But if you're looking at like a statue or something like that, it's probably a lot better to bring in a, um, a mesh and then subdivide it within that tool. I think, I think you have more control if you subdivide it locally in Notch because as soon as you subdivided it and brought it in, that's the specific subdivision that you set. Yeah. If you subdivide it in Notch, you can always uh, double check like, oh, this is too finite or it's not enough, it's too crude. Then you have an option to choose uh, your subdivision level to the matter of your performance needs or your design needs, basically. Yeah, and this conversation can easily get into where we're talking about optimization and like, if you bring obviously. in a really massive mesh, then obviously that's gonna slow everything uh, down to. Yeah, as, as Gloom says here, my take yes and no. So it kind of depends on your situation or on your rig. It yeah. could be very beneficial and it could probably be very painful if it's mistreated. With great subdivisions comes great responsibility. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, since, uh, I, I don't really see any question right here. There's one, there one, one other question. Uh, weight map deformers uh, still are not a static thing, correct? Uh, must be static set from the beginning. Um, so, no. no they, stay, uh, they are dynamic. Like, um, Armin can animate that um, so shape I, if he wants. In a previous setting, we actually animated it. I don't know if it would animate working together with the particle mesh deformer, but uh, we could definitely try that out. So. Yeah, just... Um, well, let's just go for fractal noise. There's no more obvious. Uh, yeah, why not? Yeah. No, than fract. Let's go for my. Fi let's go for Trichette. Uh, of course. How can we make a stream not using Trichette? I mean, how, I, how could I let you almost get away with it? Uh, there, there are rules of engagement. This is the the primary one. All right, we'll pull down the. Uh, actually, yeah, that is fine. Yeah, let's just I didn't move it. you were going to round it, so yeah, that works. Uh, okay, so continuous modifier would work for us here because we just want this to roll and roll and roll on the position Y. I think it's a little bit fast by default, to be honest. I'm gonna drop it down significantly. This this right here is all right. Uh, let's restart the playhead. To be honest, it's hard to say. I'm gonna read yeah, something and, else. No, try and uh, take, go to the Trichet and just scale it up a bit more. Uh, or the resolution, either lower it or raise it, I can't remember. <laughs> That one. See, we don't have to talk anymore. We just do things. Uh, oh no, it's still static. So I think Ooh. it's static with the, with the particle mesh deformer, but if you were to use it with something else, um, for instance, I'm gonna, well, let's see. If I come back to the first setting we made, I'm gonna do a, a very mischievous thing. I'm gonna delete everything, and I'm gonna add a, 
weight generate weight map deformer. I'm going to connect that. I'm going to add fractal noise because why not? Or let's be faithful to the settings. Uh, true shed because why not? Pipe it in. Shape it up. Uh, no, I don't want this round. I want this a little bit bigger. Continuous modifier. Please slide on the position Y. And while you're at it, be slow. There we go. This is all set up. I might as well make sure that we are able to see it. So show weight map. And of course, we have to switch through to the texture. Done. And let's grab some... Curl noise. Curl noise is easy. Curl noise. Curl noise it is. So let's add curl noise. Let's make it uh, quite bigger. And let's connect the curl noise and generate weight map together so they work hand in hand. So let's see. That's the third input here. Bam. Connected. Yeah, it's nice in there. So I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's static in the particle uh, mesh deformer, which kind of makes sense because I, I guess it locks into the specific shape in the first frame and then it sort of displaces in accordance to that specific shape. So it's animating with the, the simple deformers. It is static with the... Particle yeah, it must be something just... Um, particle you know, it's, probably, it's probably just the order in which things are done. Likely, likely. I, I guess this is, a, this is something that developers could elaborate a little bit more yeah. than us mere mortals. <laughs> well, let's make this pretty. Uh, I mean, I, I cannot leave it like this. Let's add some smoothing. If you can add some smoothing, you've got to exaggerate the um, push as well. How so it goes the uh, car noise. Yeah. Pull it out. And now oh, that's pull it out and then pull out the smoothing as well. How about this? Ah, see, nice. the biggest issue with Notch that I see, it's, it's a time sink. <laughs> I lost so many weekends and evenings with this. Like you, you find one node with a specific set of functions and then you realize that that node talks to another node. And it's Sunday already. You started Friday evening and it's Sunday. It just always happens like that. So I, I hope you guys found something interesting in this stream because uh, deformers are not necessarily the most popular uh, tool in Notch at the moment, which is a surprise to me because it's so powerful and interesting. So I would just like to believe that you didn't have a chance to try them out too great many times before. And I hope I'm going to see some cool stuff in Instagram with the hashtag made with Notch and deformers. That, that would be sweet. That would be great. Hashtag. Hashtag. <laughs> uh, is there any other questions or, or we are wrapping up? Yeah, if we, um, I, I'll take uh, two or three more questions and then uh, we'll get, uh, well, we need dinner. We need dinner. I'm sitting here rubbing my Depending stomach. on where you are now, you need coffee or you need a beer. Yes. And I, and I say both of the options are fine depending on the time of the day. Um, okay, uh, any more? Are we good? This is it? Seems good. I'll, uh, I'll wait a minute. All right, I, I, I we're guess good. we're calling it. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah thank you great. guys. Thank you, thank you for joining. Um, uh, hopefully see you in the next one. The plan is to have one stream a month, so we are committing to seeing you quite soon. Yeah, we'll see you next year. Uh, next year. Oh, my oh God. this year. We're done with this the last year. year. This next year, month. 2020, yeah. Oh All God. right, see you guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.